Hi, I'm John Hartman. I'm the current book review columnist for Chess Life magazine. And what I'm doing here is a video series, which I'm calling Chess Base, a first look, designed to help people understand how to use Chess Base or uh, other associated chess technology to improve their chess, to study, uh, most importantly, to have fun. One of the things I've noticed when talking to people about how to use the computer or training with engines or anything like that is that they're often intimidated by the learning curve that seems to be there for Chessbase. Um, Chessbase is a very powerful program. Um, it's, it's one of those, those few things where the advertising is actually true. Uh, Chessbase 15 just released and they've got Gary Kasparov and Vishy Anand and uh, Rustam Kazimjanov all talking in their promotional materials about how everyone, everyone they know uses Chessbase. And that's because Chessbase is a professional level tool for chess players. That doesn't mean that it has to be um, only for professional chess players. So my goal in this video is to help you understand how to actually make use of the program. And over the course of probably oh, 10 to 12 videos, we're gonna walk you through everything you need to know from um, preparing for opponents, uh, studying an opening, studying an endgame or training, uh, playing against Fritz, against some some engines, uh, some of which you probably will never have heard of um, just because they're, they're not as strong as the top guys and that's actually good for training purposes. Things like, you know, I don't even know, preparing for opponents, well I think we talked about preparing for opponents, uh, going through books, studying uh, typical middle games, searching for different tactical themes. Chess base will let you do a lot if you understand how to use it. And so what we're going to do here is basically get you completely up to speed so that you will be a proficient chess base user. Now when I envisioned this video series, I asked people on Twitter uh, what they thought might be useful for them to see in a video series like this. And international master Kostya Kavutsky made a very good point. It was, it was actually quite along the lines of something that I'd been thinking. And, and what he said was that when he has done training with people to help them understand chess base, he has noticed that they don't always understand some very basic things about how to use the program. Things like um, how to create a database, how to set up their desktop and their file structure so that their data is accessible. So things like looking at how do you, how do you put a folder on the desktop? Uh, what are the different types of databases that are, that are available to you to create? How do you copy games from one database to another? How do you, how do you merge databases? How do you remove doubles? Or uh, how do you use opening keys? Uh, we're going to cover some of that today. We're going to cover basically the most basic parts of this, what databases are, um, how, do you, how to create them, how to, how to copy and paste, how to email them if you need to, um, how to download things from the internet and we're not going to give extensive examples, but we'll use two and then incorporate them into your own databases. So by the end of this video, you should have a pretty basic understanding uh, of all the things that you need to know to do everything else with Chessbase, if that makes sense. To begin, uh, I want to talk about data and locations because it's, it's very easy, if you're, uh, particularly if you're not com completely computer savvy, to, to sort of lose track of where things are. So the first thing you need to know about Chessbase is that when you install it, it usually creates a default folder where it'll store everything. Uh, and so most of the time, most of the time, that's going to be in your user folder. So whatever your username is for your computer, for your Windows computer. Uh, in my case, my name is John. So it's in my John folder, users John. Most of the time it'll be in documents and then it'll be in a folder called Chessbase. And in there you'll have um, folders devoted to bases, databases, opening books, um, history. This is actually kind of important. Chessbase, I think by default, is set to keep track of everything you do. So anytime you open a game, it will... Uh, it will keep a record of that. It will keep a copy of that somewhere on your hard drive. And usually, again, it's going to be in that documents, chess space, history folder. So let's say you looked at a game yesterday and you can't remember where it was. 
if you go into that history folder, there's a good chance that it'll be there for you to find once again. Nice, handy tip. Um, because I'm a contrary person, and because I, I have to be, uh, I have to do things uh, the difficult way, I actually ended up installing my user folder or my database path to a slightly different place to uh, users John Chessbase. I, I kept it out of the documents folder. Um, just personal preference. I, I don't really know why, <laughs> um, but. So it's, it's, it's in a different location for me. Uh, as always, your mileage may vary. Uh, I also have a lot of data on my, uh, my, data, uh, my, my data drive, which is a solid state drive. And um, yeah, so it, it's keeping track of where everything is is actually kind of important. As I said, for the majority of you, it's going to be in that users, documents, chess space. And you should be able to find most of your things there. Um, so file location is important. Understanding what file structures are uh, or, or what database structures are, what, which, which types of databases are available is also important. And so you'll see here on the desktop, I've got five main uh, database types, a CBF file, a CBH file, a CB1 file, a CTG file, and a PGN file. They all have cute little icons or cute little flags. Uh, one of the nice things about Chessbase is that you can create, you, you can change the the little logo that you use for each one of your databases here in the database window. So if you go to, you right click your mouse and you go to properties. You can also use the shortcut of Alt Enter. I'm pretty big on shortcuts, as you can see towards the right of your screen. Uh, and we'll talk about some in a moment. But you can go in and choose country flags. Uh, I'd been drinking Ethiopian coffee when I set this up, so I chose Ethiopia. Uh, you can sort of give it a, a uh, an icon that sort of reflects what's involved there, so if it's an opening book, it'll be look like a tree, which is what the CTG files are. For endings, it's a king on its side, which naturally it looks, why not? Looks like that's what happens in endings, right? I mean, your king falls over. Uh, studies, don't really understand that one. Blitz kind of makes sense. It's a lightning bolt. Uh, Potzer, I use this for my own games. Haha, <laughs> that's a clown face. You get the idea. There's all these different sorts of icons that you can choose from, and basically it's just a way to help you quickly find something in your uh, in your database window. So it's worth sort of briefly talking about what each each one of these things are, and if we go to the folder, you can see that um, they have very different numbers of files associated with them. So, for example, a CBF folder, a CBF file, which is the the original chess-based format, uh, it's only two files: uh, a CBF, CBF, which is actually containing the data, and CBI, which is the index. Modern chess-based files, I think after chess-based six or so are CBH files, and that's uh, they call that that because that's the main uh, file that's associated with it, the CBH extension. Knowing what each one of these things is is kind of important, so I always find it's, it's useful to go to Chessbase's support, um, their, their wiki, which you can see the link to here, and in particular if you uh, search for data format you will come across this explanation where it talks about what a CBF format used to be uh, and how important that was at some point, but before Chessbase 6, roughly. And then it'll go through and walk you through what each type of file in the data structure is. So a CBH file is basically the file that contains all of the identifying material, players, tournaments, uh, sources, etc. CBG files contain all the moves and variations in the database. CBA files contain all the comments, so if you put any notes into a game or if, you, uh, if you're using Megabase and it has lots of annotated games or if you're a chesspublishing.com subscriber, that's where all the comments that come along with these things will be. There are different kinds of indexes, player indexes, tournament indexes, indexes of annotators, indexes of sources. The key thing to understand is that you need all of these to really use the database. So um, I've had friends who have tried to email me databases um, and they would say, oh, I've, I've sent you a database and they sent me just the CBH file. 
all of these things have to be sent if you're going to email someone a database in this format. There is another way to do it. You can go in and you can, via tools you or uh, the shortcut Control-Z, you can back up a database and it'll create a CVV file. And if you look, a CVV file is a compressed version of all of those other files. So it's one file that you can use to email to someone. Very handy. Um, and if you have a email program on your uh, on your computer like Outlook or Thunderbird, it will actually you can actually directly email it. You can email the selected database by right clicking, and it will create a CVV file and then email it to someone. I haven't quite figured out how to do it if you're using web-based email like Gmail or Yahoo or Outlook, um, the Outlook web program, but I suspect there may be a way to do it. I just, I'm not smart enough. So those are the two main traditional chess base formats. CB1 is a compressed version of the CBH file in essence. It's one file that contains all of the data and can be read. Not a lot of people use this. Um, perhaps because it's not uh, readable by other programs. So unless you have a very specific reason to use CB1s, I, I wouldn't recommend it. The CTG file is a tree version of any data that you put into it. So for example, I've got a tree here of all of the games that have come out or that are publicly available uh, in the Week in Chess, which we'll talk about shortly. And so instead of being a game, it actually opens up as an opening book. And you can see that there are 980,000 games in this database, uh, giving you all sorts of different statistics about it. If we click on E4, it shows you that C5 is the most popular, uh, the most popular response, etc. So CTGs are trees, and they contain three files: a CTB, a CTG, and a CTO. Last but not least, the PGN file. Probably the, the most useful file that you're going to use, uh, most useful file format besides the CBH, it's kind of like the Swiss Army knife of chess programs. Every major chess program that I know of can read PGN files. If you email someone a PGN file and they're on a tablet, they can probably open it up in an app. So if you're trying to send someone games and you don't know what program they're using, PGNs are a very useful way to uh, send them that data. On the internet, a lot of the uh, major websites will also offer PGNs for download, as we'll see shortly. So PGNs and CBHs are probably the things you're going to use the most. Now, what do we actually do with these things? I, I've created these five things here, these five databases. Uh, the question is, what can you actually do with them now that we've created them? By the way, if you want to create a database, I should mention this, you can do this one of two ways. You can either go up to the, uh, to the ribbon and do Create and let's just say test, it'll create a CBH database, CBH is the standard. You can also right click and do the same thing by doing a uh, new database, uh, control X is the shortcut you might want to use there as well. If you want to add a folder, a folder shortcut to your desktop, you can also do this by right clicking, add folder shortcut and whatever you might find. So uh, for example, um, I'm a big fan of the Exeter Chess Club's website, and so if I wanted to add that shortcut, I could just add that. Uh, I've downloaded a lot of their data over the years, and I've got that sitting on my hard drive. And so if I want to access that directly from my desktop, I can add a folder, uh, add the folder that, can, that contains it. So I could just go in and uh, open up their tactics course or their junior repertoire or things like that. Adding folders, again, right click and just go down to the uh, to the element in the dialog. So what happens with these databases? How do we actually add things to them to make them useful? Let's go to the web and let's go to literally my favorite web page on the internet, theweekinchess.com. Uh, those of you who have seen my Chessbase 15 uh, introduction video, you'll know that, that I hold what Mark Crowther does in extremely high esteem. He's been doing this now as a the website says since 1994, basically since the internet started. Well, not since it started, but since it became uh, something of a household item. Crowther is doing this for free. <laughs> uh, he is making these downloads available to you every week, 
every Monday is, is Twic Monday. So I implore you, if you like this video, please do go to Mark's page and make a donation. If you donate 30, uh, 30 pounds, he will send you a compilation of all of the games that have ever been in Twic, which is a pretty good deal. You get 2.2 million games, and I've actually donated a couple times now. That's how highly I think of what he does. So the reason I bring this up is that uh, if you go to the Twic page each week, you can download each week's games. So on the 19th, I'm, I'm making this on the, night, the evening of the 21st. Happy Thanksgiving, if you see this tomorrow. Um, he, on the 19th, he, he produced an issue of Twic that had 2,000 games available to download. And you can download it either in PGN format, or you can download it in chess-based format. And I would suggest downloading in chess-based, because uh, that way you don't have to convert it to PGN if you don't need to. I have a folder in my user downloads Twic, uh, in, my, in my downloads folder called Twic, where I download these things each week. So I've downloaded it now. I can go to that folder and I can unzip it. Uh, I use 7-Zip, which is a freeware program to do my zipping and unzipping. I think you can unzip things natively in Windows as well at this point. So uh, you just need to open it up, extract it here, and you get a CBV file. That is the compressed version of a CBH file and all the associated uh, files that go along with that database structure. Okay, so we can go into we can go into our database, uh, our main database desktop. We can open a folder. We can e we can go up here to the to the ribbon and click the open icon, or we can right click and click uh, open database. You can also use the shortcut Control plus O to do this. So I want to open the database. I'm going to click on the CBV, and you'll see it. If we go back to the Twic folder, which I believe we can. Downloads. You'll see that it has uh, it has uh, exploded out the the Twic file. So there are now most of those associated file types as part of the the database that's now on my hard drive. Two thousand games. You'll notice that there are all sorts of tabs here: players, tournaments, annotator. There are no annotators here. Sources. Um, there are also some things here as well, openings, themes, database, uh, tactics, strategy, endgames. If these aren't showing up in your database window, you can go to, excuse me, you can go in your main, uh, your main window to options and go to the miscellaneous tab. And then you can highlight this thing or you can click the, uh, click the box that says you use theme keys. And that way it will... Uh, add all those, the, those extra keys to your database folder. So we've downloaded this, we've got 2,000 games, and now we want to add it to a different database. I've got a The Week in Chess database uh, that I've been uh, I, collecting for years. I think uh, this is one of, the, one of the databases that I got from Mark Crowther for that 30, uh, 30 euro, 30 pound donation. Uh, I've also got a smaller database that is all of the publicly available databases. So I think TWIC publicly goes back to issue 920, which is somewhere in 2012. It's almost a million games. And I also use that to create an opening book or a tree, a CTG file, that I, I use to um, quickly look for you know moves in, in any given opening position. So if I want to copy this, if I want to copy this new issue of TWIC to my databases, there are a few ways I can do it. The first thing I can do is I can just copy it. I can, if I'm on top of a database, I can just go to the copy icon. I can uh, do control C, which is a keyboard shortcut. Um, I could even bring it over. I could drag it to the clip database. Clip database is a uh, sort of a, a holding, uh, a holding pen for any games that you might want to copy somewhere else. So you could copy it to the clip database by dragging it over, and then you could drag the clip database to something else. I'm actually just going to drag it directly to my Twic database. And I'm going to say, okay, copy games. Uh, the classification thing, the classification notch is, is, is clicked so that it, it should update any of the opening keys. If there are any multimedia files, which there aren't, it would copy those as well. Always import annotations, not something you have to worry about with Twic. There are no annotations, generally speaking. 
So, okay, everything looks good. I'm just going to hit OK. And you'll see now it is importing the games very slowly. Okay. I don't quite know what's going on. Ah, well, that was strange. Um, it appears to have done what it was asked to do. And so if I click on the database now, with luck, I go to the Sources tab. Yes, the Weekend Chess 1254 is now part of the database. So, um, yep, there are almost 3 million games, uh, I'm sorry, 2.3 million games in this database currently. It's, again, not to beat a dead horse, but it's well worth your money, and Mark is well worth your support. Uh, I can also copy it to my Twic, uh, my, my a uh, smaller Twic database, and again, it's uh, the dial. This is a little strange. I, I I suppose this is because it's a fairly uh, early iteration of Chess Base 15. Um, I can also copy it to my opening book or to that CTG file, and you'll notice this dialog is a little bit different. Um, you can change the your your, your um, options here. I usually uh, leave it to uh, to an ECO relative length, so that basically it's it's going to give you about 20 ply after the end of ECO, uh, or or where ECO ends, or 20 moves. I do believe. Um, if you ever want help, you can or more to know more about it, you can just click the help button. So I'll just hit OK, and it will upload this. Uh, it, it will copy this to my opening book pretty quickly. And yeah, so you can see there are now almost 2,000 more games in here. So there, there are a number of ways to copy and paste. Uh, you can just drag, you can do the copy, and then, uh, as we're going to see in a moment, you can just copy a number of games to a database. Uh, let, let's actually take a look at that. So I've got set up here in the examples folder, uh, I've got a number of Twic issues that I've downloaded. There are the last, uh, what, last 10? So I'm going to highlight these. There's a couple of ways you can do it. You can hit Shift and then click over, or you can, I'm sorry, you can just click them all. I actually like to use the keyboard for this. I will just highlight one and then hit Shift and then use the arrows to highlight them all. And I'm just going to uh, I'm going to right-click this and say Convert to CBH. So basically, I'm, I'm uncompressing them when I do this. Oh, might not let me do them all at once, okay. Okay, so I just, well, I'll click each one individually then. Again, I don't know if that's something that is part of the uh, the new version of Chess Base that's being used here. I think this is Service Pack 2, so it's pretty early. Um, I'm not sure if that's a bug or if that's just how it's always been. Um, I suspect it, it's something that may need to be worked out, but not sure. So again, I'll, I'll just unzip all these manually. Where am I at? 52, 53, 54. Okay. And I'm just going to click on all these. Again, if I want to click them all individually, I can control and then click. I've highlighted all the ones I want to uh, I want to use, and I'm going to go up to copy. I'm going to hit the copy uh, button here, and so now the computer knows, Chessbase knows that I want to copy them all to a different database. I'm going to go down here and copy them to each one of these. So I'm going to put them on the CBF. And I'm going to paste them. It will ask me if that's really what I want to do, and I'll say yes. Okay. I'm going to do the same thing for each one of these. Copy them all to CBH. You notice the CBH file format is a lot faster because it's uh, modern and uh, the data is broken down in more useful ways, I suppose.
Okay, so in each case, we're going to end up with approximately, well, about, about 34,600 games. Part of the reason I wanted to show you this is that if we go and we take a look at the file size, you might get a sense of, of why these things are so interesting. So the CBF file is about, what, almost six megabytes taken together. The CBH files, if we put them all together, are about 11. The CB1 file, which is the compressed version of a CBH essentially, is 15 megabytes. The tree is almost 65, so the tree is, a, is very big. And then the PGN file is 35 megabytes. So in terms of compression, the CBF file is probably the smallest, but it's also uh, it's the most corruptible and probably the least useful. Most people don't use CBF files anymore. CBH is typically what you're going to use, and PGN as well. Um, the PGN files are just very, very big because, as we can see, they're, uh, they're essentially just text files that computers know how to read. So that's why they're so big. It's literally about 35 megabytes of text, which for 35,000 games isn't necessarily that bad. It's just it's a big file. So copying and pasting is pretty easy. You can either drag and drop. You can use the copy and paste buttons over here. Uh, you can also use that clip, uh, the clip database uh, that, that we see on the main screen. By the way, anytime you open a new database or, or sort of decompress one, those databases will appear on your desktop. And if you want to get rid of them, again, you can control, hit the control button, and just click all of them. Click the ones you don't want, and then you can remove them by uh, right-clicking and saying remove, or by uh, hitting the delete button. And it will ask you, actually it won't ask you, it'll just uh, it'll just remove the icons. It's not deleting the database, it's simply uh, removing them from your desktop. So if we want to go in now, let's go into the CBH file, just very, very briefly. And there's a few things I do want to look at here. Um, let's say you were curious as to whether or not there were any double games in here. Sometimes, because of the way Crowther puts his issues together, games that appear in one issue might appear in the next. And so you might want to remove them from your from your database. So you can go to Tools, Find Double Games. And there are all sorts of different ideas about how to um, best configure this, this particular window, this Find Double Games window. The best discussion I've seen is in a uh, thread at chesspub.com. I will try to put the link to that in the discussion below uh, below this video. But uh, you can go through here and the names don't have to be exactly the same. In general, if you're looking for doubles, uh, you don't want them to be exactly the same. Let's say there's a misspelling um, or the data is not 100% clean. That will allow you to catch similar names. The same thing with tournaments and moves. And if you want to be more precise, you can go for, uh, under the similar moves tab, you can go for slow. Fast is generally good enough. Uh, it will catch most of the things you're looking for. Faster is super fast. It doesn't catch as much. Different, uh, different options here as well. If you have annotated games and you want to uh, decide how to handle different, different double games, so if there's different annotators, maybe you want to keep them both or delete any annotated games, merge them, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of things you can do here, and it's, it's something that, again, if you have more questions, take a look at the help file. So I'm just going to hit OK, and it will go through, and lo and behold, it found 52 doubles. So we'll pull up this window. I had it set to clip doubles, or uh, and so it puts them all in the clip database so I can see them. And as we go through, you can see that most of them uh, involve this Guernsey Open. And I guess there's one from a Grandmaster tournament. I don't know where that is. Probably in... It's got Catronius, it might be Greece, I'm not 100% sure. But the good thing is that once you clip them, or once the, once the, uh, the program has identified them, you should be able to go in and then, I don't know if we can find them here, filter for, 
Alliance. Can I find deleted games? I don't think I can. We're going to look at how to search games uh, in a different video, but I was actually just curious to see how this might work. Once it has found those doubles, it has uh, blacked them out. So if we go back to the clip database, you'll see that they're, um, they're not blacked out, I'm sorry, they're struck through and they're in a different shade. That means that they've been deleted in the database. They're still there. They're still actually in the database. We just have to remove them to get rid of them. So we can go to Tools and then click on Remove Deleted Games and it will pack the database. Uh, so it will get rid of the doubles and uh, shrink the file down so that it, as if the, the it's a, it, it, it's actually literally move, removing the doubles from your various database files. And it rebuilds the database and there we are. So finding doubles, again, right clicking, any right clicking can get you to a lot of different tools in almost any chess space window. But you right click, go to remove, uh, you go to find, uh, find double games. And then you can, uh, after you do that, you go to remove deleted games to actually take them out. By the way, if you're curious about the, the, the integrity of the file, let's say you've copied you know, 20 different databases into one database and you're worried that there was an error introduced somehow, you can also right click and go to check integrity. And so that will basically do a, a systematic uh, check of the structure of your files and make sure that there are no errors in any indexes or anything like that. So you can click integrity, uh, correct errors if possible, you might want to back it up first. I'll show you how to back up in just a moment. But uh, for the moment, we're just going to say yes. And it will say, OK, critical changes will be made. You have a backup. We will have a backup sh uh, shortly. Uh, so we'll just go ahead and say yes for the moment. And fast test is fast. The slow test is pretty slow here. We'll just go with the fast test. Uh, I think the slow test is more thorough, but the fast test most of the time is good enough. And it goes through, and it checks everything, and it says there are no errors. So this is. Uh, a structurally solid database, which makes sense. We just created it. If you want to back this up, again, you can right click. Right clicking is is gets you a lot of things in chess space. Uh, and go to backup database under tools. You can also just hit control Z. I'm going to do that right now. Control and Z. And that'll allow you to archive the database. It'll ask you if you want cryptid or uncrypted. Unless you are Gary Kasparov or I'm um, Fabiano Caruana or Magnus Carlsen, you do not want encrypted. And the reason I say that uh, is that if it's encrypted and you forget the password, you'll never be able to get back in. The chess space people make a big point of it in their literature. They can't help you. So unless you have a very, very good reason, like you're, you know, you're, you're someone, you're, you're Fabiano's second and you're uh, having to send him ultra sensitive data, I would never use cryptid. Always use uncrypted. We do that. It's going to ask us where we want to save it. I might even just create a folder that says backup. And we'll go in here and we will create the new backup database. So if we go to our, you know, we go back to that, that file, the examples, and we go to the backup, and there's a CBV file that has all of the data that we just uh, we, we we just saw on that that CBH that that ten issues of Twic. All right, a few more things, and then we're gonna call it a day. I do want to show you how to edit some of the um, the elements of a database. So let's say you have let's say you're running a tournament and you are collecting all the games that are played and you enter them into a database and you don't do a particularly good job or you aren't careful when you put the names in and you save the games. So let's go to my examples folder and this is um, a pretty good file but there are some errors here. Uh, my friend Mark Kraut, uh, no, Mark Caffron from, from Iowa sent me the games from the Iowa Open. If any of you are in the States and are looking for a good tournament to play at the end of August, the Iowa Open is excellent. It's in Iowa City, and the people who run it do an excellent job. So if we're looking at this, we can see that there's a um, whole lot of players. And if we go to the different tabs here in uh, the database folder, we can go to the players, for example. And we might see that, for example, there are 
two Stephen Cusimanos. There's a Stephen and a Stephen J. I know Steve. He's a good guy. Um, he doesn't suffer from schizophrenia. There's only one of them. So I want to make this into one entry in the database. So if I highlight both, and I can do this with the arrows, um, I can do shift and then arrow down, or I can do control and click, and I can click on both. I can then edit them, and I can do F2. If I click uh, the function key, F2, on the keyboard, it will ask me if I want to merge the two players. I can also go here to the right click, and I can do edit. Again, it'll ask me to merge, to merge the two players. And then I have to choose which name I want. I think Fide actually um, keeps the middle initial. So here, at least, we're going to just leave it. And you'll notice that it puts them both together. Uh, Ken Fee, who is a Kansas City organizer and tournament director. There are not four of him. There is only one. So again, we just want to merge the players. F2 to do the edit. And then we have to choose how we want to do it. Um, you know, maybe in your database, it's you just want to have Ken Fee. Maybe that's how you know him. Or, um, you know, whichever one of these you choose, you can just type it in, hit OK, and it will collapse all of them together. Pretty useful. Um, and it's something, believe it or not, there is a, uh, I won't mention his name, but um, an author of a fairly well-regarded chess book, um, he didn't know that this was possible. He didn't know that you could edit games in a database. And so when I told him this um, via, I think, a message on the chesspub.com forum, uh, he, he was shocked and uh, uh, very happy to know that uh, he could edit his data this way. This F2 trick is something you can do on any one of these fields. Well, uh, you can do it in the games. So let's say you just wanted to edit one game. Maybe uh, Mr. Gibbons was only rated 2200. Again, you can just hit F2 and the data will pop up and you can change whatever you want to change. You can also go into tournaments and do the same thing. If you want to highlight all of them and hit F2, you can merge the tournaments and rename them whatever you want. Iowa Open um, place is not chess.com. It was actually contested in real life. So we'll get rid of that. And we'll just go up to here to, uh, oh, the city was Coralville. And you can change it however you need to. But yeah, so it collapses all of them. And now when you go back to the game screen, the tournaments are listed as uniform. They're all the same. So this editing uh, within a database is, is pretty useful. And uh, if you're a stickler for clean data like I am, this is something you're going to want to do a lot. By the way, if you want to just add it, if you want to add a, a game to this database, let's say you were you, you got a game on a score sheet that, that wasn't here, you can go to, you can just click board and, you know, F4, C5, I don't know, D5, Knight F3. And let's say they just agreed to a draw. You can then save it. You can go to save game or save game as. It'll ask you the database you want to save in. And then you just click on it and you fill in the data as needed. Save game was canceled because I don't want to save that game. You can also do this from within uh, the main screen. You can just uh, open a board, do something. You want to save it. You can again, you can hit control S. It'll ask you the database you want to save to. You can go up here. I've got a few little shortcuts on top of my screen. So I've got a little, um, a little, looks like a three and a half inch disc save icon. Uh, you can just click that and it will help you save. By the way, if you are also, for what it's worth, if you are inputting games into a database, let's say we go back to this, let's say you're, you've been in, inputting these games all day. When you open a new board, if you go to input mode, uh, it will get rid of a lot of the options, but it will also make it very easy for you to save the game. It will carry over all of the previous data, and uh, you can save pretty easily here. Um, it, it even gives you the same round, assuming that basically it, it follows up on what the last game was. It's assuming you're putting things in order. So pretty useful as well. Um, one last thing I do want to talk about, and that is how to structure your databases. 
I mean, we're almost at 40 minutes now, so I, I do, I'm glad that you all stuck with me if you've gotten this far. This might actually be the most interesting part for those of you who have used Chessbase before, because I've got some examples from, um, from some pretty strong players. Again, I, I sort of asked about this on Twitter, and lo and behold, the hammer, John Ludwig Hammer, he, uh, he, he uh, tweeted out the screenshot of what his openings database looks like. And it's pretty well organized, but as he says here, um, he says his organi he, he's, he claims that his organizational skills are, are terrible uh, and that basically it's a hodgepodge of different things. So he says uh, GM Shanky, which would be uh, Sam Shankland, and Kasparov, Gary Kasparov, of course, the, uh, who, who has the, had a legendary database that I think they called it the Beast, I'm trying to remember, or was that Kavalik's? Uh, database during the 93 match. At any rate, uh, his opening preparation and his opening uh, theory uh, is legendary. And so I guess if Hammer has seen the, the Kasparov database, I'm, I'm very impressed. Um, but yeah, Kasparov, I guess, would be pretty pretty well organized. So you can see here, this is, this is something he tweeted out on the 14th, so this is a week ago. And... Um, you know, uh, so an early H6 in the Queen's Gambit, uh, his his opening prep in the Queen C2 Nimzo after 4 D5, well, it goes at 123 moves, so that's pretty amazing. I suspect he's got it all memorized, of course, because, you know, these guys are really, really good. Um, it's, it's pretty organized. Um, and what's really important to understand is that there are sort of different levels of organization, and the key thing is really just to set up a structure that you understand. So to sort of make that clear, I'm going to show you two other... Um, two other examples. One from International Master Kostya Kavutsky. Uh, he was kind enough to send along a couple of screenshots of his King's Indian database. Uh, I don't think it's any secret that Kostya plays the King's Indian. If you just look at his games in Megabase, it's, it's abundantly clear, so I certainly don't feel like I'm, I'm telling any tales out of school. Uh, I do appreciate him sending this. So you can see here that he's got pretty detailed notes on just about everything and uh, organized so that he can find things quickly. So if he's looking for a line in the Sami, uh, he can find it. Uh, there's also, this is the second part of it. Um, I guess he couldn't fit it all on one screen. Uh, you know, so King's Indian sidelines, things to do in the, Fien, in the Fienchetto, uh, what to do against uh, the London system, for example, if you're a King's Indian player. All this is, is part and parcel of how he structures his database. And, um, you know, this is something that makes sense to him. It's, it's labeled very cleanly so that he can find things quickly and update them. Uh, I think it's, it's a nice example of what an opening database should look like. Um, some of you may have seen the Caruana database. I, I hesitate to put this on because I, I feel, frankly, I feel kind of terrible. Uh, I'm the person who tweeted this out, uh, and I feel kind of bad about it, but at the same time, I mean, it's it's out there, and I think this is useful for us to see that, you know, even here, this is, I'm assuming, just one day's work and probably just for the screen. You know, I, I deep down, I suspect this is some misinformation, but but who knows. Um, you, you can see that he's got this labeled in such a way that the ideas are, are very easy to find as well. Again, you know, Petrov, bishop f5 plus bishop e7, that means something to Car to Caruana or his assistants. So they've got this structure in such a way that they can find things quickly. Since other people are, are willing to, to show their, their hand here, I, I suppose I will show mine as well. Um, so, you know, if I look at my openings, I've got, for example, my, my old uh, 1E4 database. And I've got um, all the Roy lines. Let me see if I can actually boost this make this a little easier to see there we go excuse me all the Roy lines that I might play against uh, so the Schliemann the G6 line which I guess is called the Aronian line at this point uh, you can tell by the dates since when I actually update an opening line I tend to change the date so you can see I haven't actually worked on my E4 openings in quite a long time, and that's because I don't play E4 that much. Um, 
certainly not anymore anyway. I, it's something that, that I can play, but I, I haven't done it in a long time. Uh, I've got this structured sort of um, by opening. So, you know, E4, E5 lines, um, Sicilian lines, so things in the, so you know, I used to play the Sozin against the Nidorf. Um, I tried to play it against the Classical as well. And then some other things I was looking at, a, a um, Queen F3, 6 Queen F3 in the, in the Nidorf, a sideline that uh, my good friend John Watson recommended me years ago. Uh, and then, you know, some other, some other sidelines as well. Uh, the, the Queen D4 line in the, the Open Sicilian. Uh, I, I can't recommend the, 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 date, the, the work at chesspublishing.com enough. It's the basis for a lot of my files. Uh, I'm a subscriber. I'm a, in the forums. I'm an, uh, an admin for some of the, the, the sections in the forums. So definitely check it out if you are looking for opening, uh, opening information. I think it's uh, crazy that they can give you that much opening data for, for what you're paying for it. Um, yeah, and so, you know, chess, you can see a lot of chesspublishing.com stuff. Uh, some lines from Mosilenko and the French. But, you know, basically, this, this is just organized in a way that I can find things quickly. So if I want to look for a, you know, for, for what I'm playing against the Karo Khan, if I'm playing the Advanced or the Panoff or whatever I'm playing, I can find the line. And here, this is something I never even finished, I suppose, the, you know, what to do against the G6 line and the Panoff. Um... Yeah, I can find it pretty quickly. This is an older database for me. More up-to-date, I think, is my, my D4 database. And again, I'm, I'm not really giving away anything. Uh, it's, you know, no one's going to prepare for me. <laughs> but um, this I've actually sort of structured according... It's ordered by ECO, which not a lot of people use ECO codes anymore. I think they're immensely valuable, just as a way to sort of... Uh, you know, talk about an opening quickly or to organize your lines in such a way. So, you know, I've got everything ordered according to ECO. Uh, the dates that I last worked on something are in here, the, the dates that I last updated something. So, for example, today, um, earlier on, I was looking at uh, some of the lines that Jay Bonin recommends in his, his book, um, Active Pieces, which, contrary to popular belief, I did not hate. Uh, actually, as you if you look very closely in here as I screen through, you'll see there are a number of lines that, that are recommended in that book that I actually have uh, at least studied to see if I can't make use of them myself. But what's interesting is when I looked at it, um, I tend to star a line. like if, So I will click F2 or uh, right-click and go to Edit and just uh, edit the game data. And then if I'm working on something, I'll put three stars in front of it. I'll also do this in a game file. So that if you know if I want to see where I've been or what I'm working on at the moment, I'll see those three stars and know that that's currently where I am. It's a trick I picked up from proofreading uh, when I'm writing my columns. If I need a placeholder for the moment, I'll just put three asterisks in, and then I'll know that I have to put something else there, unless I screw up and somehow it gets in the magazine, which which hasn't happened yet, but it might. Um, again, what's interesting to me about this, looking at you know. Uh, Hammer stuff and Kostya stuff and even the, the Caruana screenshot, everybody organizes their things differently. Everybody organizes what they're doing differently. The key idea is to do it in such a way that you know where everything is. So, you know, when I went through <clears throat> Jan Gustafsson's uh, Queen C2 videos on Chess 24, I broke it down according to, I think this is actually by video, but I made sure to break it down in such a way that if I you know, if I'm looking for what to do against the um, the D5 line, well, my analysis doesn't go out to 123 moves, but I can see pretty quickly what I'm playing against E takes D5. And you can also see here, yeah, this this knight up, this, uh, there's an asterisk here. I guess I never really finished that. I never went back and looked at that. I suppose I need to. Yeah, I suppose I do need to go back and look at that. Um, anyway, this is enough to sort of give you an idea of what the databases and how to structure them. Um, you know, even something like I'm trying to think of this here, like a like a Latvian data. I had a I had a database on uh, how to play the Latvian because I wanted I thought this would be a good surprise weapon at some point. I've broken it down pretty deeply, um, and you know, um, for example, all the the work I put in, which came largely came from Chess Pub and some other sources, I have the original data still here that I before I broke it all down. 
Uh, and at some point, maybe I'll show you how to do that too. That's kind of an interesting thing to try to figure out how to take a big file and break it down into usable chunks. But I, I kept it because there's no reason to delete it. And um, you know, it might come in handy at some point to go back and just look at the giant tree of, of data that I've created. Speaking of, we are now 50 minutes in and I am going to call this video a wrap. So thank you for watching. Uh, I hope that you have found this useful. Um, yeah, in the next video, we're going to, I think we're going to talk more about uh, a little bit more about databases, like what kind of databases you want to have. Um, you know, you want to have a big reference database like Mega Database or Twic, uh, opening databases, my games potentially. Um, and then we're going to go in and actually look at some things with an engine and try to figure out how best to use an engine and how to understand what it's really telling us. Because um, if, if watching people on Twitter um, and in, in you know, various chat boxes at Chess24 or at Internet Chess Club, if that's any, indi any indication of, of how people use engines, they're, they're using them very badly. So I want to look at some examples of what good engine use looks like and then try to understand why so many people use it so poorly. That'll be in about a week, give or take, uh, depending on my work level. And yeah, I appreciate everyone watching. We're again, we're 51 minutes in. I hope this was useful and I do appreciate feedback. So uh, leave a comment below, leave a nice comment, please. And uh, yeah, let me know what you think. Thanks a lot. And yeah, we'll see you in the next video.